a plan that is far above and beyond anything you could ever think or imagine. Hello and welcome to Phronesis, where you get practical wisdom from the Word of God. I remain your host, Dineo Molokwani. As it is our culture on this show, we bring you men loaded with the wisdom of God to provide you with words that will help you resolve life's most challenging issues. And I strongly believe you have enjoyed our past episodes. We will be kicking off this week's episode with Pastor Hebziba Raja. She is the wife of Apostle Abraham Raja of Kings and Priest International Church based in Johannesburg. She is a lawyer by profession. She and her husband has been taking us on a series tag, God's Master Plan. On her previous episodes, she spoke about how to discover God's master plan for your life and also gave us five reasons why we should follow God's master plan. On today's episode, she will be giving us practical ways to follow God's master plan. Exciting, right? Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. If God knows us before we are formed, then definitely He has a master plan for our lives. One of the best ways to know how to follow that plan is to listen to the anointed teachers of the Word. And Pastor Abziba Raja will be doing justice to this topic on today's episode. Stay tuned. Hello viewers at home, we are excited to be with you today. This is Hefsiba Raja. With me here today is Dr. Abraham again. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, my darling. It's always a pleasure to share God's Word with you in particular. In this session, we're going to look at what are the practical ways of actually following God's master plan. And the first key that we have for you today is you must be in the Word of God. Think about it. God's Word, which is the Bible, is the manual which God has given us His creation. Think about if you, are, if you have a iPhone, for example, you cannot look at the Samsung manual in order to understand how the iPhone works. So even with us, in order to understand our master plan, God's master plan for our lives, we must always look at God's Word first. Never get tired of hearing the Word of God. The Word of God is above anointing oils. The Word of God is above fasting. The Word of God is above church. The Word of God is about every other element that is related to the Word of God. When you throw yourself entirely to the Word of God, you come out looking exactly like that. Just as it is impossible for you to jump into a swimming pool and come out dry, you cannot delve into the Word day after day and not become in God's master plan. Amen. And God has put His Word even above Himself. So He's not about to reinvent anything in your life that is not covered by the Word of God. And number two, we want to say, be planted in a local church. Because in the local church, that is where you are fed, that is where where you, your first experience and impact of your calling is. You know, the psalmist says, um, blessed is he who is planted in the house of God because he will flourish. If I were to give you a practical example now, if I, if I were to think of an example of a garden and I kept taking out that plant and moving it from one piece of soil to another, it will never have the sufficient time it needs to develop the roots it needs in order for it to develop up there. When we skip church and we don't come to the gathering of the saints and when we move from church to church, we don't give ourselves the correct time to grow the roots that are sufficient for us to bear the fruits that God has in store for us. Amen. And God is really a God of process. And in the local church system, He's placed their mentors, people, yeah. pastors and leaders who are there to help you, sometimes even to discover the call of God in your life and that master plan of God in your life. So if you are always moving from place to place, you are uprooting yourself mm -hmm. Like Dr. Abraham has said, you are putting yourself from being planted and from that place where God is able to water you and, be, and you are able to grow. We often get people that come to visit our church and uh, just some time ago a couple came from another church which I knew and respected very well and I told them to go back to their church. 
And the reason is very simple. Church is not a gathering. Church is a calling. Church is so specific in its design that God has put the man and the woman of God standing on the pulpit with the unique ability and anointing by God to be able to identify, to clarify, to amplify, and ultimately to glorify the gift of God that is inside of you. When you take yourself out of church, you literally take yourself from an environment that God has designed to take you to that next season of your life. Our next point is look for the master plan search for it jeremiah 29 in particular verse 13 says you will find me if you search me with all diligence it takes time it takes effort to understand the plan of God for your life. So it's not a just about you going before a pastor and then they say you're called into this and you must tomorrow walk in that. No, it takes time. It takes a searching. It takes, you know, sacrifice. So please make sure that you always put an effort into uh, looking and searching for the plan of God for your life. Our Savior said, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He compared the kingdom of God to a precious gem someone sold everything to receive. The kingdom of God, the calling of God, the master plan of God is so specific, is so beautiful, that when you discover it, you will literally give everything up for you. You know, I want to tell you that God has not hidden the plan from you. God has hidden the plan for you. He says to us has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And I trust God right now that there is a stirring up a prophetic move in your life for you to realign yourself to the master plan of God. Amen. It just reminds me of the Easter egg hunt that our kids did um, not so long ago. We hid the, the Easter eggs and it gave us so much of joy when they were searching for it and they were finding it. I believe that the Father has hidden it for us. Not that we mustn't find it, but he has hidden it for us to be able to find it. And it gives him pleasure and joy when we finally find that plan for, for our lives. The next one is be obedient to the small things God instructs you to do. Remember, God says, who much is given, much is required. Although he says it starts with the little things. Whoever is faithful in little will be faithful in much. Don't despise the call of God where you are. Begin to follow it diligently. Do those small, small things and God will lead you to bigger doors. Amen. Uh, number five and the last one is serve other men and women of God. You know, service is something that is so key in the kingdom. Even our Savior was a servant leader. He says, for you to be able to be lifted up, you must serve. Humble yourself and then you will be lifted up. Uh, We've come again to the end of our show. This was really exciting. We're looking forward to the next session with you. But if you want to connect with us, please remember that look at the email addresses below. If you want to get our free ebook, if you want to learn more about our free Bible school, connect with us, even on social media. From Dr. Abraham and I, we want to remind you always that the kingdom leader is in you. Greetings, this is Dr. Abraham S. Roger extending an invitation to come join our Bible school. We want to train, equip, activate, and release you into your ministry. We offer a program from first year all the way to PhD level. We are fully correspondent, and our material and our broadcasts are available all over the world. So why waste any further time? Contact us today. And just remember, we are free and waiting to train you, equip, and activate you into the ministry God has in store for you. See you soon at one of our campuses. Matthew chapter 18 verse 20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You cannot be in the gathering of sons of God and not know how to follow God's master plan for your life. Hidden in service to humanity lies greatness. There's a powerful connection between service and greatness. You may have received great dreams of your future outcome, but the connection between where you are and the future of your dreams is in service. Thank you so much, Pastor Hebzibo Raja. The message has been a tremendous blessing to our lives. 
If you have thoroughly enjoyed this message, why not join Pastor Ebziba Raja on the 31st of August 2019 as she hosts Women of Worth Conference of Kings and Priest International Church. Details of this conference are stated below. The happiest people are not those getting more, but those giving more. Pastor Paul Amwako of Kingdom Restoration International Ministries, based in Accra, Ghana, has been taking us on a great message on effective living. For the past few weeks, he has given us vital points on how to live effectively. Last week, he looked at kingdom giving as a means of living effectively, and he made us realize that if we are made of God, then we don't have a choice but to be a giver. If God could give his only begotten son, then what is your excuse? He promised to continue on the teaching of kingdom giving this week. Let's join him as he continues the teaching on kingdom giving. I'm sure you don't want to miss this. With Jesus joy, I welcome you to today's broadcast. I'm so excited to come your way again. I'm sharing on kingdom giving, kingdom giving. The principle must be understood that life is all about giving. I breathe out, which simply means I give out carbon dioxide, and I breathe in oxygen. And this process of giving and receiving is what keeps me alive. The reason why we still have food to eat is because there are farmers who keep sowing and they reap. If water doesn't have an outlet, but collects in the place and doesn't move, that water becomes stagnant and actually will begin to stink. Life is about giving and receiving. The Bible says concerning our God in the popular scripture of all times, John 3:16, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So the God we serve is a giver. If God made us in his image and likeness, then we are likely going to be givers. Giving then will become natural. And anytime we give, anytime we give, we are creating the opportunity to receive. Kingdom giving is my topic. For some time now, there are Christians who are wondering, how do I give? What the right way to give? Considering, for example, Jesus talked about giving. And Jesus even at some point said, when your right hand would give, your left hand should not know. How should I go about it? Um, I went to church. Pastor asked us to sow a seed. What all of that? So let's break it down very quickly. When you go to the church of the Old Testament, which is the children of Israel in the wilderness, with Moses being the apostle. When they would build the tabernacle, the Bible says God told Moses in Exodus 25. Let me read it to your hearing. Exodus 25, the verse 1, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. So God asked Moses, Tell the children of Israel to bring me an offering. Of every man that gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. So you are getting some criteria there. Every man, every person, every woman that gives willingly with his heart, you will take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take of them. Gold, silver, brass, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, and goat's hair, and ram skin dyed red, and badger skin, and shitim wood, oil for light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense. Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod, in the breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So God initiates the taking of offering. So I want you to understand that. The Old Testament is a shadow of the things that were to come in the New Testament. Christ being the light, standing in the middle. The Old Testament was a shadow. So God tells Moses, Tell the children of Israel to bring me an offering. It's very important you understand. God required the offering. But there is a way the offering should be given, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In the New Testament, it is even described in a better format. In the Old Testament, God says that every person that gives must give willingly, which means if you were forced to give an offering, that is an error. 
if you felt pushed to give an offering, that is an error. If you gave to impress a lady in church, now I'm just assuming you did that, I know you didn't do that, that is an error. Because the offering, whatever you give, should be done willingly. Willingly. So the first criteria of kingdom giving is the offering that is given willingly. Let me read 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the verse 1. Apostle Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth. He said, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, in verse 2, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Ache was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready, lest happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared. So Paul is saying that the people should be prepared to give in their giving. We, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go on before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before. Now listen, that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty, not as of covetousness. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. For every man, according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So we have said, number one, kingdom giving must be done willingly, as every man, Apostle Paul says, as every man purposes in his heart. The second thing we learn is that kingdom giving must be done cheerfully. If you were given the offering and it was because somebody was pushing you and you didn't have joy, please don't do it. Somebody will say, what about the scripture that says that we go bearing precious seed weeping? That means it's a kingdom giving that was given sacrificially, not because somebody pushed you. So today, I would want us to just stay on these three for now so that we don't get confused. All giving in the kingdom is done, number one, willingly. Number two, it must be done cheerfully. You should be dancing to the front. But when God places a demand on you and you realize this is coming from God and it is that heavy, it's something that is costing you. But because it is God's, we do it. Even if you wept and it wasn't cheerfully, it was because we were giving sacrificially, but not because anybody forced you. I trust that this few that I have shared will let you look forward to next week. I'm looking forward to next week sharing with you on the part two of this sharing the seven other ways left. We'll see you next week. We make a living by what we get. We make life by what we give. Kingdom giving goes beyond giving money, giving your time and skills generously to the things of the Lord. And that is part of living effectively. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse seven says, every man according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. You should not be forced to give, and I will admonish you to give joyfully in order to ensure your life is lived effectively. Thank you, Pastor Paul. We have been really blessed by this message. Our last teacher for today is Apostle Humphrey Oseni of Voice of the Spirit Ministries, also known as Dominion Life Family Church, based in Johannesburg, South Africa. In his last teaching, he concluded a series tagged, Who We Are in Christ. He addressed the identity crisis facing Christians, and he also made us realize the enormous power deposited in us as children of God. I can boldly say that we are transformed by that series. Today, Apostle Humphrey Oseni will be teaching on the subject tagged, How to Live a Life of Dominion. I believe you won't want to miss this. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Apostle Humphrey Oseni, and it's always a great pleasure to be here with you. Today, I'll be teaching on the subject which is amazing, how to live a life of dominion, walking in dominion. Now, many believers 
pray, make a lot of confessions, and they wonder why they're not getting the results they desire. Faith is much deeper than confession. Confession is vital. I learned from great mentors like Kennedy Hagin, Freddie Casey Price, Bishop Hafford. I learned the principles of faith. But to many believers, all about faith is, they think about faith is speaking and confession. Mm. But even a parrot can repeat what you say. A parrot can say, I'm wealthy, I'm more than a conqueror. A parrot can say, I'm the head and not the tail. They can just repeat it. But that is rote. So there's a principle I want to share with you today that will enable your faith to move to greater heights, enable you to see results, leaving the realm of frustration, struggling, you're praying, you're confessing, nothing seems to happen. And that's the principle of imagination. One day I was praying and God told me that if I who is omnipotent and all-powerful, had to imagine how do my children expect to see victory, expect to see the release of God's power if they don't learn to involve their imagination. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul was praying that we might know the exceeding greatness of his power in us. So Paul wanted the church to understand that there is power in them that is beyond their imagination. The next verse, he said that it's the same power that he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So we are talking about the power that is called the resurrection power. It's a power that exceeds greatness. The power in every believer who is filled with the Holy Ghost exceeds anything God has ever, ever done before. So if that's the case, how can many Christians live a powerless life? Well, it's not the absence of power that's the problem. It's not the lack of authority that's the problem. It's the, it's the lack of knowing how to release this power. Now, what did God do in Genesis chapter 1? The Bible says that the, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. A hopeless situation. The first thing God did, the Bible says the Holy Ghost moved upon the face of the deep. Now, that word moved in some translation says the Holy Ghost hovered. It's from a Hebrew word that means to incubate, to visualize, to imagine. So God, through the Spirit, was visualizing what he wanted. He was imagining what he wanted before he began to speak. Every miracle, all the supernatural work that Jesus did was a product of his imagining as a habit, the supernatural. So for you to see results, for example, you're believing God concerning your business, your finances, or a healing of a loved one. And many people, when they are praying for a loved one, they, and they're praying for him to be healed, but in their mind, they keep on seeing the person sick. They see the person in the hospital. They, they, they cry over it and all that. That kind of confession is limited. It won't release power. When you're praying for a sick person, you've got to imagine the person well. Imagine the person walking about. Imagine the person in his office. And that's the secret of the miraculous. David Cho who had the largest congregation in the world, over 700,000 people in South Korea. When he was sick with tuberculosis, what caused his recovery was that he began to imagine himself well, moving about, doing that kind of thing. And as a result of that process of imagination, and of course followed by confession, he began to see that tuberculosis leave his body. The same thing happened to Kenneth e. Hagin. At the age of 16, he was bedfast with an incurable heart disease and a blood disease. And what happened to him? Initially, he saw himself in the hospital. He saw himself being buried. He saw his parents crying. But the time came that when he began to believe, Mark 11, 24, that I believe I've received my healing. Kenneth Hagin began to imagine himself healed, imagine himself preaching. He said to himself, what will I do if I'm well? So he began to imagine himself preaching. He even began to take down notes. He said he could only use one hallelujah because he didn't really know much. But the point is this, the turning point of the miracle was his imagination. So that's why many Christians miss it. It's just rote. They are making confessions and confessions, but in their mind's eye, they still see themselves poor. They see themselves sick. They see themselves broke. No. What should precede your confessions, what should be part of your confessions is, the, is, is taking God's word and seeing what that word says. God's word says, I'm healed, so you see yourself healed, you see yourself strong, you see your business prospering. And as you do that, your confessions will have potency. Your confessions will release power. You see, words are vehicles, and your imagination is like fuel. Imagine you have a car and there's no fuel. It's not going to go anywhere. Hallelujah. 
So when you begin to imagine what God's word says concerning anything you are believing, anything you are confessing, it's like putting fuel into that car. So your confession are, are vehicles, but your imagination is putting fuel into that vehicle. It's putting power into that vehicle. So when you imagine scripture, you are putting the power in that scripture. You are putting the power of God's word into your words. So your words will have miracle working power. There will be a release of omnipotence as you speak. So many Christians miss it because they are void of imagination. Actually, they are full of fear. They are full of doubt. They have a ne negative picture in their mind. But if you take God's word and begin to meditate upon it and begin to see what it says, and then you make declarations, I tell you there's nothing that can stop the power in your words. You're walking on limited authority and power. So it's time to take your faith to another level. Begin to imagine what God's word says and declare it, and nothing will be impossible for you. Oh, oh, oh. Hello everybody, this is Pastor Abraham. And this is Pastor Hepzibah. We want to have an opportunity to be able to sow a free ebook in your life. So why don't you send us an email on the details below? We want to sow into your growth with God. So hurry, send us an email now. That's right. And remember, we're on the corner of Elant and Cherry Street in Randburg. And we hope to see you in one of our dynamic services. See you soon. Psalm 19 verse 14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Speaking your faith is not enough to take you out of your realm of frustration if your imagination is not put to work. Our thoughts and imagination are the only real limits to our possibilities. Thank you, Apostle Humphrey Oseni. That was a life-turning message. Thank you so much for staying tuned to Furnaces. We have come to the end of this week's episode, but we will be back next week with another great set of men of God on our next episode to inspire, empower, and equip you with God's Word. I remain your host, Dino Molokwane. This show is produced for you by 1John54 Media. Until next time, keep shedding light. <music>